Great Little was sent here to Eltham College, a school for the sons of missionaries. He was born in China in 1902, two years after Abrams. Eric was just six years old when he arrived with his older brother, Robert. Was it important having a brother here? I think so. I mean, the school functioned as an extended family, but I think Rob was sort of not only a brother, but a surrogate parent in some way as well. Mm. So they, they kind of were a family together with their family really in China. He didn't see his parents for sometimes, I think, seven years at a stretch. He wrote every week, but, and they wrote to him, but he would not have seen them for seven years. What, what did he do in the school holidays? Uh, he would have gone to Guardians and been, been with Rob, so, so again, surrogate parents in a way. So, here I am in the rogues gallery, all the old sporting photographs. And here's Eric, and there's his elder brother Rob, who looks very, very dominant and in charge. This side is the rugby side. And here's Rob again, he's captain of the rugby. And there's Eric, he's still looking a bit sort of timid in the background. But if you come down here, 1918, Rob's left. And look how Eric's sort of grown in stature. He's much more in control. My visit to Elton showed me that for this college, religion and sport went hand in hand. The young Eric only saw his parents once in 11 years as they continued their missionary work in China. This mix of Christian and athletic discipline defined the man Little would become. In Chariots of Fire, Eric Little was played by Ian Charlson, who for me brilliantly captured the spirit of the man. When he's giving a speech to the assembled company in the Highlands about uh, being a Scotsman, being a Scot, and suddenly, in the middle of the speech, uh, um, there's a... Thank you for reminding me that I am and will be whilst I breathe. <laughs> a Scot. Instead of being thrown by the cow mooing, Ian laughed and said, and went with the moment, said, I am and will remain a Scot. And then what also then happened, of course, is the audience, which we had a, we had a nice reverse shot, and all the people listening to him, they laughed as well. So it's a marvellous moment of naturalness, entirely created by the fact that the actor involved didn't say, oh, cut. Eric Little was born in China, educated in London, but saw himself first and foremost as a Scot. So I've come to Edinburgh, the place Little called home, to discover how his identity developed as a Christian and a sportsman. What does Eric Little mean to you? He was a great Scotsman. He was a fantastic runner, a very famous runner at the time, and we remember him. Do you think he was a Scottish hero? So all, all of your generation would know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, we know. We weren't with him, but we know. Of course, no, you're far too young for that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you do Chariots of Fire? Chariots of Fire. Can you do it? Here you are, Chariots of Fire on the bagpipes. First time I've ever heard that. <laughs> Eric Diddle followed his brother Robert here to Edinburgh University to study pure science. He would have been taught in these very rooms. But his time here was defined by his overriding passion for sport. I'm going to the university library to discover just how good he was. Unlike Harold Abrams, he seems to be the rather middle-aged looking man. Physically quite small, not, not really like, like a, an athlete of today. But looking at these um, annual sports programmes of the period, we can see that little, 100 yards, little. 220 yards, little. 440 yards, little. 220, little. Well, everything. Amazing sportsman. It wasn't just running that he did, either. He played rugby. 
But he didn't just play it, he played it really well. There's a picture of him here. He played for Scotland eight times and won seven of those. Here he is mentioned in a student magazine. He had a rare combination, pace and the gift of rugby brains and hands. Makes openings, snaps, opportunities, gives the dummy to perfection, does the work of three if necessary in defence and carries unselfishness almost to a fault. I mean, to me, that sort of kind of sums the man up. It goes with his religious feelings and being unselfish is part of, of the deal, I suppose. As a sporting hero, Little's name was known throughout Scotland. And because of his fame, he was a key speaker at Christian rallies. Little now had a platform to preach his beliefs. I want to compare faith to running in a race. Then where does the power come from to see the race to its end? From within. Eric Little and Harold Abrams were the two fastest men in Great Britain, so it was inevitable they would meet. Well, this is Stamford Bridge, home of Chelsea football. But in July 1923, it was an athletics ground, and it's where Harold Abrams first met Eric Little. And there were fireworks. I'd like to wish you the best of success. Thank you. And may the best man win. Harold was so confident he was going to win. He thought Eric's unorthodox running style of flailing arms was no match for him. Get to your marks. Get set. Now these two athletes would find out who was the best. Eric smashed Harold, pulverized him by four yards. Struck. Harold was devastated. I don't run to take beatings. I run to win. If I can't win, I won't run. So he went out and got himself the best trainer in the world. He was called Sam Musabini, seen here with Harold in this rare film. I'd spent the whole winter for the first time concentrating on style, trying to perfect my stride and my starting under old Musabini with his great fanatical theory about arm action. I use my arms very much more than the modern sprinter do. Whereas Little relied on God, Abrams put his faith in the science of sport. Repetition in training and focus on time channeled Harold's nervous energy. Harold Abrams was a player, and in those days, it was a strictly amateur undertaking. And the idea you could just employ a, a professional coach to, to, to better your performance, but that you could afford to employ a professional coach. And this must have got up the noses of an awful lot of people. Under Musabini, Abrams would get the chance to race little again, this time in the 100 metres at the Paris Olympics. But they were both due to face the fastest sprinters in the world, the Americans. Well, it's 6.30, Victoria Station. And this is where Harold Abrahams and Eric Little met up with the rest of the athletes on their way to the Olympic Games in Paris in 1924. They took a, a long time, a long journey, and I'm going to find out what happened on the way. So, I'd better go, got a train to catch. You know, what's amazing reading this is our attitude towards the Olympic athletes back then compared to now. I mean, in this biography of Harold Abrahams, he says, the British Olympic team departed for France in their ill-fitting blazers made of shoddy material almost without comment. No first-class travel. They were in the back of the bus. In the film, Eric Little hears some shocking news as he boards the boat for Paris. Mr. Little, sir, uh, what about the qualifying heats on Sunday? What did you say? On Sunday, do you think you can beat the Americans? Little did refuse to run on a Sunday, but unlike the movie, he actually found out eight months before the Olympics, and he never buckled under the pressure from the establishment to change his mind. There's only one way to resolve the situation. That's for this man to change his mind and run. 
Don't state the obvious, Cadogan. We have to explore ways in which we can help this young man to reach that decision. I'm afraid there are no ways, sir. I won't run on the Sabbath, and that's final. Fortunately for him, Little was selected to run in the 400 meters, which fell on a weekday. But it wasn't a distance he was favored for. Well, today is a beautiful day, very different from July 1924. Yeah. Harold Abrahams remembers we had a ghastly crossing, sea rough, and a risk of thunderstorms. I spent the entire journey keeping my lunch down and my spirits up by singing Gilbert and Sullivan. No, I, I won't be doing that. No sound at all, we never speak a word. A fly's football would be distinctly heard. Here's a photograph of Harold Abrahams in his uniform. He wasn't pleased with it. Right here, he's wearing a pair of trousers that obviously for someone six inches shorter, and a jacket for someone who's twice as big. And if you look at his face, he looks really, really hacked off, which I'm not surprised. I've eventually arrived in Dieppe, eight hours into my journey. And like the British team of 1924, I've still got a train to catch. Well, in my reckoning, that's 12 hours travelling to get here from London, and I'm absolutely knackered, and I'm sure that Little and Abrahams and the others were too. I... They had to race, though, in the next few days. I'm off to my hotel for a good night's sleep. <laughs> 